Welcome back to the With Joe Eby podcast. So last time out, we were talking about the Sim Nicholas Taleb's ideas and applying them to education, career, and learning. We're going to continue and talk about another uh, figure this this time called Peter Till, a man called Peter Till. Luke's back with me again. Hello, Luke. Hello, Joe. How are you, mate? <laughs> I'm good. I hope you've recovered from that absolute drumming. Mind bending. From the Taleb, yeah, the mind bending <laughs> concepts and ideas. He is very, yeah, intense ideas. So you did very well, not for the faint of heart. Uh, that was episodes 181 to 194. Now we're moving on. So interesting question today. Um, one of the first, I'll intro Peter Till in a sec, but the interesting question which we're going to unpack what sort of product is education? This is interesting, right? This is the seed I want to plant. Is it an investment good? Is this something you invest in? Is it cons- a consumption good? All right? Is it an inflated insurance policy? Is it a crazy tournament? This is what we're going to come back to. And all right, so a bit of context on Peter Thiel and who he is. So Peter Thiel um, is an entrepreneur and investor. I mean, he's pretty well known, especially in the Silicon Valley world. I mean, most known for being one of the co-founders of PayPal. And, you know, PayPal is very famous in Silicon Valley because of the PayPal mafia. So obviously this is around the real, this is, that was all happening in the lead up to the um, dot-com boom and all that. So this is when startups were going kind of crazy and, you know, internet was becoming this bigger thing and everything like that. He was also the first outside investor in Facebook, I believe in 2005, which is no mean feat. So he saw what was uh, coming. Since then, yeah, he's also co-founder of a company called Palantir, which is quite a big company too. And, but he's beyond that, you know, there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there. This guy's a real thinker. <laughs> he's a real, I think he was at, he studied law and I think he also, he also was, yeah, a debater, I'm pretty sure in college. So he, his, his ability to spin an argument, he's got some great YouTube clips, which is some of what I've unpacked for today and a great thinker about education for sure in a couple of episodes. We're going to do about five episodes on him, Luke. And one of them, we're going yep. to talk about the Teal Fellowship, which is his initiative in education. So yeah, there's a lot of fire he throws, a lot of contrarian opinions. He's known as the contrarian. He has a lot of different ways of looking at things. He doesn't go with the flow at all. He's very happy to be the one person who disagrees, which is one of his favorite um, biggest ideas actually. And so very exciting. And then, yeah, Luke, we'll play off you because you're pretty cold to this stuff, which we like because you're in the yeah. position of maybe many of the listeners. So that's great. And then I'll just acknowledge here in the show notes, there's a sign up to the newsletter for anyone who wants to get every week, just the consolidation of what's happened on the podcast and a bit of a breakdown of everything and links to the episodes, if it's easier to keep track that way. Anyway, enough of that. Let's go back to this question. I'll throw to you first, Luke. When you, if you can remember back that far, why did you go to university? What would, what would have been your main reason? That's a good question. Initially, towards the end of, towards the end of year 12, I was doing a few, obviously we were doing a few elective subjects and IT was, IT was one of them that I sort of gravitated towards at that time of studies. And also have my, my dad is, has a background in ICT as well. So that was kind of where I got the idea to go into IT as a first preference for university. But if I'm, if I'm being honest, I don't think I had much thought outside of that. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. So the reason why I want to ask is because Teal, this is one of the things, if you go through the YouTube clips of him and I'll have, I should have a blog post for this too, where I can link some of the YouTube videos. if People want to go deeper into him. He's frequently having this debate, like what is, what do we actually want this education stuff for? What purpose is it actually serving? Like what role is it actually playing in Mm. society? So the first thing he he asks, he goes, is it a, is it an investment good? Is this a, that might be the category you kind of put it in maybe subconsciously when you were doing it. Like, am I going, putting time and money? whether it's upfront or, you know, delayed and paid off later. Am I putting time and money into this experience so I can get something back normally learning or some sort of qualification for some sort of pathway? So I'm expecting, I think latently with you, the IT pathway, if you're going to get into that, you're figuring, well, this is how. I think that was the idea. Yeah. He goes, so that's his first question. Is an investment good? Mm -hmm. Then he goes, it's kind of strange. 
right? And oh, sorry. So I'll, I'll take a step back. So think about any time you're trying to learn, if you're investing, right? I might, I'm not just going to pay $300 for a course or something because it's a fashionable thing to do. Normally you'd expect someone paying $300 if it's an online course, for example, because you want to learn something specific. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm assuming it's because you're going to be able to earn more than $300 with that help. Or it has an equivalent value. Like the value of that stuff you think will exceed what you've paid for it. So that's the yep. concept of learning as an investment. Mm-hmm. But he's saying is college, for example, university, things we choose, like young adults choose to go and do, is that investment? Secondly, here's an interesting one. Is it a consumption good? Does that make sense? Yeah, so what would make... Is it, what... is it something you're consuming as an experience? Mm. Very different to an investment in a way. So something you can, like, for example, I don't really think of when I go on a Kentucky trip <laughs> or a holiday. That's I mean, an investment. You, can, you, put, you can say it's an investment yourself, but we typically, typically call those types of like transactions or purchases consumption goods. So you're saying, is this just something, and this is definitely um, happening. I'd say more in the college style, the very the US style, rather than the Australian where a lot of people don't necessarily live on campus norm. Because the college thing, that looks like a great experience. It also yeah. looks a lot of fun in the movies, but I have a lot of friends in the US. I have a lot of friends who went on exchange to the US and, and that whole that whole like campus life is a consumption good. So that's, it's not necessarily this tangible, the parties and the meeting people and whatever, the self-experimentation and being somewhere away from home. It's not necessarily the tangible like career direct learning stuff but it's a, a different part of it. It's, it's, it's an experience that's being consumed. So Teal's second question is, is it a consumption good? But he goes, I don't think it is. He goes, it, you, can, you can make a case for some people it's those things, but then he gets towards this idea that he's often looked at it as an inflated insurance policy, which is number three. You've come off mute. Do you have a thought on this? Not... <laughs> Not just yet, things are bubbling. But oh, okay, I thought you were yeah. about to jump in. <laughs> no, no, no. Let them bubble. Bubble's an interesting term. With Till, Till loves using the word bubble in association <laughs> with education too. Now, insurance policy, what the hell does that mean? Well, you insure a car or a house or possessions normally, right? And you insure them because in case something happens to your car, you don't have to pay the full price of replacing a new car. The insurance company will, will cover it right? If anyone's unclear about how insurance works, you pay a small premium every year. Maybe it's, I don't know, $1,000, $1,500, because if there's ever more damage than that, they're going to cover it. Super basic concept insurance. For a lot of people, and I think this is true, uh, especially the, our parents' generation, for example, the way they think about it, it's an insurance on your future. Yeah, that's how it's sold. Yep. That's how it's sold, at least when, when you're discussing it with your parents, or at least for me, you always have something to fall back on, for example. Exactly. That's what my parents said to me too. So this is why mm. I say this is very our parents' generation. Yeah. And it's conditioning that has definitely extended into our generation for sure, in large parts, so for better or for worse. But yeah, it's the idea that this will, you know, it's, it's the concept of if you have this degree, I believe, you will be fine you'll be financially, whatever, comfortable. And that it, otherwise it's a bad insurance product if it doesn't do that, mm. right? You don't want an insurance policy that doesn't cover you. You can make a debate about whether it does do that. I'd, I'd say in many cases it won't these days. I think the ability for it to be a good insurance policy, if it is one, will get worse for most degrees over time. But obviously that, that, that assumes you're going to complete it. I, I don't think it's a insurance policy if you haven't graduated for example, yeah. but this is a, this is where it's the psychology around education, mainstream education, college, you know, gets tricky because now you get these people, if they look at it as an insurance policy, they're trying to complete it. And I think over time, the opportunities to do other things in that time and with that attention and energy, there'll be some very exciting things you could do with everything that you're going, spending four or five years putting into an insurance policy. Mm. So that's his that's his third idea. But then he has a fourth, Luke. He has a fourth. And the fourth is, he goes, the way, and this is, the most, I think, the most recent opinion I've seen of his, is now I actually look at it like this crazy tournament. 
and he's, he, he makes the point that, you know, the, the worst thing something like EIL could do, which is a prestigious, you know, university, world renowned, he goes, the worst thing they could do if they want to, if the dean of whatever the college wanted to get lynched, he could let in three times as many people. In other words, like it, the value of it is from the exclusivity. Yes. Yeah. Right. And what you've definitely got is you got more and more people lining up for maybe it's the insurance product or, or basically to enter into this tournament. And <laughs> so you got more and more people lining up, but the education quality doesn't necessarily change. The relevance of it might even be getting worse. And the, yeah, and the number of positions don't necessarily change, but you got more and more people kind of lining up for it trying to get into this crazy um, tournament where if you get into the prestigious ones, this is the tournament aspect, tournament aspect, you, you, you know, you get the, you're going to be successful. It, it's yeah. a very, uh, it's a very kind of like a heuristic. It's an oversimplified narrative, right? If I get in, if I go there, I'm supposed to be all good. And, and people who come out the other side kind of have an opinion on that, but it's hard to communicate that to people going in because they're kind of on the conveyor belt. So I, I, he, people, he people said, going in, how do you, how do they know what they're, what they're in for well, other exactly. than listen, listening to people they sort of respect and need guidance from? Yeah. I think a lot of the people they listen to from a different generation, which is the tricky part. You mm. don't think that, wow, how much has the world really changed since then? But he, I think he makes a good point here. He goes, of course, if it never ended, it would be great but it, it doesn't end. So the, even I go back to the consumption good, for example. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of, you know, value you can have in these in colleges, universities, right? I keep saying that even though there's a lot of anti university sentiment, rightly so. Okay. Rightly so. And, but you can go there, have fun. There's a campus, there's everything like that. Right. It's very enjoyable, but the, the trick is, and even the insurance policy, but the trick is when you're paying for something out of debt, it, ch it does change the way you should look at it. So for example, if I said to you, Luke, you know, I spent $8,000 on a trip to Europe and you, you might, your question might be, did you have a good time? Mm -hmm. but if I say I paid for it on my credit card, right? I didn't have the money, but I paid it for that whole holiday on my credit card. Yeah. You might have, well, if you're a uh, good friend, you're going to challenge me. <laughs> like, Joe, mate, you probably should have waited until you had a bit of money and then gone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and this is, uh, I'm not saying university or college is purely a, a holiday. For some people it is, though. But you don't typically, rule of thumb, when it's an experience or it's a consumption good, you don't pay for it using debt. Yeah. Normally use debt, right? Common sense says you use debt normally to get a financial outcome mm. because if you get a financial outcome that is you make some sort of money you pay it back so you know someone who's studying to become a dentist right it's an expensive degree i think in the us i think it's the same in australia but if you know how much you're going to earn you, your ability to get that job is is pretty good as long as you've got the qualification and you know how long it will take you to pay it back then you know that's that's pretty what a gift that you can pay for that using debt. That's, that's phenomenal. That's the yeah. beauty of financial concepts. But when it's to party for four or five years and not think about the rest of life to come, that is, you know, it'd be great if it never ended, then it's being that consumption good, if you're using it that way, is being built on a very faulty foundation. So this is the key, this is the key thing. So this is the, so starting off our series on Peter Thiel, this has just been the first episode and there'll be another one tomorrow on five reasons for the education bubble. We're going to take this conversation forward. And but yeah, that's, that's the summary. So the first question is what actual sort of product is this education theme? Like what is his actual purpose? And that's what Thiel kind of unpacks first. Okay. So that's, I'm just going to jump in. So this is a popular framework he uses to evaluate education in general so he'll look at it from these four points or well his point is it's this big lumped thing right it's really hard to be clear on the reason you're there because it's easy to tell yourself the story that it's this investment you're making in your future really you might be there for the actual party or for the insurance policy and you might not be aware that you're just participating in this crazy tournament 
right so it's kind of um bringing some awareness to why you're yeah the, the concept is that the nature of going there equates to guaranteed outcomes after but just because I went and got into the IT degree at U- University of Technology, that, you know, that's, that's sorted me out. Yeah. So the, the problem is if more people have degrees, then, so yeah, this is his way of unpacking first, like, what is the point of this actual thing? Yeah. Tomorrow, let's unpack how messy it kind of is. <laughs>